Recently, I played Bioshock Infinite, and I couldn't help but be taken aback by the enormous amount of praise it's received from critics. I'm not sure I'd say it's an outright bad game, but I wasn't blown away by it either, and I wanted to take some time to address the undeserved critical reception it's received by highlighting many of its problems. This video will contain spoilers for the entire plot of Bioshock Infinite, so if you're interested in playing it, I'd advise you not to watch this video beforehand. First, a quick rundown. Infinite starts out with Booker DeWitt, the protagonist, on his way to Columbia, a floating city in the sky which is ruled over by Father Comstock, also known as the Prophet. The city is very nationalistic. Even though Colombia has seceded from the US, they see themselves as true Americans. Although initially it seems like a utopia of sorts, there exists another tier to their society made up of slave labor in the form of black servants and immigrant Irish workers who are treated as second-class citizens. Over the first couple of hours, Colombia and its citizens are the focal point, and it's clear the game carries a message about how nationalistic ideals can be carried to extremes in the form of racism. Here's my first problem with Bioshock Infinite. Although it presents a situation which is perhaps a bit more thought-provoking than the average game, it does nothing with it. In the second half, this stuff is mostly dropped for a story about multiple worlds and a focus on Elizabeth. Even when the racism subplot is given the focus, it rarely accomplishes anything other than shoving it in the player's face with signage. For a game lauded as pushing the medium forward with mature storytelling, the racism stuff really lacks any sort of nuance. It also lacks any sort of bite. Over the course of my several playthroughs of the game I heard the word negro a few times, but never the word nigger. Obviously I don't have any first-hand experience of the early 1900s, but it's my understanding that negro was the general term, and nigger the disparaging term for black people back then. You would think a game with such a heavy emphasis on racism would have that disparaging term at least a few times. Similarly, I never saw anyone get lynched, I never saw anyone get beaten for not doing a good enough job, I never saw any mention of black servants being raped by their white masters. The portrayal of the racism stuff doesn't go anywhere near far enough, and I can practically see the boardroom meetings in my head where people decided they weren't allowed to use the word nigger even though it would have been said regularly by a racist populace. I understand it's a sensitive word, and my use of it in this very video may have even ruffled some feathers despite me meaning no ill will, but I find it more dirty to erase it altogether and pretend it doesn't exist, because it does. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. You can't be politically correct and portray a story like this at the same time. In trying to be politically correct by avoiding sensitive topics, the game undermines its own point, because a lack of these elements makes Colombia look more attractive than it would in reality. One good example is the very first choice presented to the player at the beginning when Booker wins the raffle, and the player has to choose between throwing a baseball at an interracial couple or the event organizer instead. In reality, if a mob had gotten their hands on them, the consequences might have been far worse. She might have been lynched and he might have been tarred and feathered, but instead this is all reduced to throwing a baseball, which we don't even get to see happen anyway. Considering the time frame, Colombia might not be so bad compared to some parts of the United States, something Booker even says himself at one point. The raffle moment just seems juvenile to me, especially since the player's actions have no consequences anyway. The way the controls are handled during this moment are also mind-bogglingly stupid. Keep in mind Bioshock Infinite is a first-person shooter, on a basic level, it requires a player to do two things, point the camera where they want to look, and shoot projectiles. Everyone is familiar with these controls at this point. The player remains in first person the whole game, and during this moment they're handed a projectile. So what's the obvious way to handle this situation? Massive button prompts, apparently. This is a game that so many people seem to want to desperately believe is intelligent, and yet it treats players like absolute morons by insinuating they wouldn't be able to throw a ball using the regular controls. If players were just handed the ball and asked to throw it at the couple, I bet a much larger percentage of them would. Many wouldn't even realize throwing it at Fink would be an option. This could have placed them in Booker's shoes, since he's under the pressure of the mob mentality, and the player is under pressure from the game to do what they're told. Instead, there's just button prompts, and it ends up being nothing more than a wasted opportunity. The so-called choices in the game all turn out to be meaningless in the end in Bioshock Infinite's most pretentious design choice. Ken Levine has said he's more interested in what's happening in a player's head as they're forced to make choices rather than the outcomes those choices have, and to an extent I agree with this. Any choice we make in a game lacks consequences for us because they don't take place in our reality, but they can still make us reflect on ourselves and realize things about ourselves. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be branching decisions though, and really the only reason I ever cared about any of the choices in Bioshock Infinite was because I was expecting them to impact the outcome in some way. 
For example, the scene where Elizabeth asks Booker to pick out a cameo. One has a cage and the other has a bird. Obviously, there's a parallel here, since Elizabeth spent her entire life locked away. So when I was presented with this choice, I paused and thought about it for a second. The bird seemed like the obvious choice, since it represented freedom in contrast to the cage. But I wondered if it might be a trick. Naturally, they expect you to go for the bird, so they hide something good behind the cage instead. Ultimately, I went with the bird, not wanting to risk the potential outcomes of the cage since it seemed to have bad connotations. My thought process here was entirely about gaming the system to come out with the type of ending I preferred. I was thinking about this choice solely because it was presented to me in a game. In reality, if a girl came up to me and asked me to choose from a bird or a cage, I wouldn't really care. I'm not much into jewellery. This choice doesn't reflect on me at all, and I'd argue none of the others do either, because they're presented in such a ham-fisted way that I could only think about the effect they would have on the game itself. It's also funny how Elizabeth passively goes with whatever choice the player makes as well. Somehow I don't think fashion advice would go down so easily for me in reality. Much praise has been heaped on Elizabeth, but really she was one of the most disappointing aspects of the game for me. I'll admit the game never felt like a tedious escort mission, but the way Infinite has achieved this is cheap. Game designers have struggled for years to make escort sections enjoyable instead of frustrating, and Bioshock's answer is to remove Elizabeth from the equation completely. Enemies will ignore her, she has no health bar, she can't be taken away, and she can't be damaged by the player. This reduces her to an invincible non-element and makes absolutely no sense considering how important she is to the story. If anything, the enemy should be trying to recover her at all costs, but instead the focus is placed on killing Booker. This betrays the design philosophy of Infinite in general. If something doesn't work, it's easier to just cut it or simplify it rather than try to solve the core problems. Take hacking for an example. In the original Bioshock, this was done with a minigame which determined the player's success. It became repetitive playing the same minigame over and over, and it arguably wasn't a great minigame to begin with. Instead of trying to craft a more satisfying, less repetitive minigame, or finding some other interesting ways for the player to hack, Infinite just reduces it to a temporary hacking vigor. Now, I'm not going to cry about the removal of the minigame, specifically because it did get pretty repetitive, but to remove it is to remove a whole host of other stuff as well. There were hacking tonics in Bioshock 1 which made hacking an easier pursuit for players who had difficulty with it. The various things the players could hack also had different levels of difficulty, so players were forced to make a choice here. Either they could take those tonics at the cost of other ones, or deal with the more difficult hacks themselves. No such trade-off exists in Infinite, and because turrets can rarely be hacked in advance of an engagement and can't be hacked permanently, the player's options are reduced. The original Bioshock often allowed players to move around the environment and hack stuff in advance of a fight. This could have easily carried over to Infinite, but remember this is a game that doesn't trust players to be capable of throwing a baseball. It also doesn't trust players with more than two weapons at a time. This limitation is utterly atrocious, and the engagements don't even seem to be designed with it in mind. I frequently ran out of ammo and was told by a prompt on screen to look for more. That's kind of tough to do when enemies drop ammo which isn't even usable by the guns I'm carrying. I spent a lot of time in combat running around like a headless chicken trying to scavenge for munitions or other weapons I could use. Seems like that wouldn't have happened had Booker been capable of carrying more than two at a time. Infinite assumes you're too dumb to cycle between more than two weapons, and it also assumes you're too dumb to use health packs. Even the map has been removed, although there probably wasn't any point including one since the exploration has been toned down significantly as well. The original Bioshock was hardly a masterpiece itself, but how anyone can look at the gameplay of Infinite and see it as an improvement is baffling to me, especially since the gunplay has barely improved. The guns feel as limp as ever, and enemies are often bullet sponges who barely react to being shot. The shooting galleries are more open than they were in Rapture, but the lack of med packs punishes a player for coming out of cover. In other words, the core mechanics and the level design seem at odds with one another. The controls are nothing special, and the weapons are all uninspired. The sacrifices Infinite makes compared to the original Bioshock would have been fine as a different direction, had there been other improvements to compensate, but instead the game hasn't even been rewarded with more satisfying shooter mechanics, despite an even larger reliance on them. The enemies are another step backwards, barely any of them use vigors to fight back with in contrast to Bioshock 1 which threw a lot of upgraded splices at the player towards the end. The big daddies were also a lot better than anything Infinite has to offer because they were passive until the player struck first, and players had more weaponry to play with. This resulted in a situation where players could plan ahead of time how they would inflict a lot of damage to the big daddy without allowing it to get close, they could use the environment to their advantage. Of course, this was only really necessary if Vita Chambers were turned off, otherwise the player gets as many chances as they want. Even with an increased emphasis on combat, Infinite refuses to ditch this respawn mechanic, and in fact makes it even worse. 
In Infinite, enemies will regenerate health when the player respawns, making it possible to lose your way into a corner if you start becoming starved for ammo or money. Dying repeatedly will drain both of those resources, and a limited weapon count makes ammo tough to find for the right weapon in a pinch. This is particularly noticeable during the ghost fights later in the game on harder difficulties, where the bullet sponge boss will regenerate a huge amount of health once the player dies. Combining this with infinitely respawning enemies has to be one of the stupidest design decisions I've ever seen. If you happen to have the wrong weapons, then going through these fights on hard mode makes for one of the most frustrating, poorly thought out engagements I've ever seen in a computer game, and it highlights just how poorly thought out the core mechanics are. There was never a moment in Bioshock Infinite where I felt I was enjoying myself and being challenged at the same time, because everything starts to break down as soon as it becomes challenging. The end boss in Bioshock 1 was one of that game's biggest flaws, it was an incredibly ill-fitting moment and the fight itself wasn't much fun. Again, rather than try to address this and finish with a satisfying boss fight, Infinite is content just to strip out the final boss. This was the case in Bioshock 2 as well, and in that game I was relieved they had opted for a finale event rather than an explicit boss, because it didn't work out in Bioshock 1. I would have been okay with the ending sequence in Infinite, if not for the inclusion of Songbird. Songbird is obviously built up to be a boss fight. There had to be some point in development where this was the case. He's designed to look somewhat like a big daddy, and he pops up several times, so of course players are going to expect a climactic battle with him, but nothing ever comes of it. Instead, he's brought onto the player's side and then it's button prompts to ask him to smash up zeppelins. It's incredibly disappointing, and the game isn't served well by undermining the player's expectations in this regard. Even when Infinite isn't removing things outright, it still falls flat on its face. The total vigor count is slightly lower this time around, which isn't a problem in and of itself. In fact, if you ask me, the plasmids in Bioshock could have done with some culling, since several of them overlapped. But this overlap is still hugely present in Bioshock Infinite. There's possession, a stun, a stun, a shield, a damage dealing stun, a charge, a stun, and a push. The only remotely new ability is the shield, and the overlap on the abilities is even clearer in Infinite since all eight are equipped at once. For the most part, the Vigors have just been blindly carried along from Bioshock with no attempt to improve them at all. Another thing brought kicking and screaming into Bioshock Infinite are weapon upgrades, which don't make any sense in a game with a strict two-weapon limit. Often I would pump upgrades into my favourite weapons, only to find I didn't have the ammo left to use them when I really needed them, forcing me to pick up some unupgraded weapons and use those instead. The weapon upgrading has been turned into a gamble, since the player has no idea ahead of time what weapons the game is going to provide them with when they get to certain points. Perhaps I was supposed to go through the game continually buying ammo for the same weapon over and over again to ensure I could continue to use it. But it's incredibly counterintuitive to expect the player to stick to two or three guns for the entire game. As if this wasn't bad enough, the game introduces extra versions of some weapons later on, which paradoxically end up being worse than the originals in most cases because the player hasn't had a chance to upgrade them. This is particularly frustrating because they pollute the weapon pool even further, meaning a player is even less likely to find a weapon they genuinely like when they need it. There's so much in Bioshock Infinite which is poorly thought out or at odds with other elements. When a turret is hacked and a player has to wait for the possession spell to wear off before they can destroy it, that's terrible game design. When audio logs are placed next to parts where Elizabeth will inevitably talk over them, that's poor level design. When melee executions are only possible to perform on most enemies when they're one hit away from death anyway, that's wasted potential. When lockpicking and health packs are stripped from the player's control so they can make an otherwise useless companion seem useful, that's putting a minor concern before the core gameplay. I imagine the majority of the effort when it came to design was placed on scripted sequences and set pieces instead of improving the moment to moment actions the player would be performing. I'd be lying if I said some of those scripted sequences weren't well executed, sometimes downright impressive, but at the end of the day anyone who's played a modern first person shooter has already seen plenty of stuff like this. They're first person cutscenes, with varying degrees of player input. They might be pretty to look at, but they're ultimately nothing more than a roller coaster ride, a cheap thrill. The effect of these has long since worn off on me, and I imagine many others feel the same way. So if the gameplay is schizophrenic and underdeveloped, then Bioshock Infinite needs to fall back hard on its story to be a worthwhile experience. Right away, one major element stripped out compared to the original Bioshock is the morality system. This definitely needed some work, because the repetitive nature of harvesting little sisters turned them into just another gameplay element rather than the moral choice it was supposed to be. Once you made that decision for the first little sister, you were likely to stick to that choice for the rest of the game. Flawed though the morality was in Bioshock 1, at least there were different endings depending on what the player chose, another thing which Infinite lacks. The lack of multiple endings wouldn't be harmful if not for the fact that the ending is terrible anyway, 
it has to be one of the dumbest explanations of the many worlds theory I've ever seen. I know the rebuttal to this is going to be that I didn't enjoy it because I don't understand it, so I'm going to take a minute to break down the plot in great detail. This is the timeline of events. Before the game starts, Booker takes place in the Wounded Knee Massacre and ends up slaughtering Native Americans. Later on he's overcome with guilt, which tempts him to baptise himself and be reborn. In one timeline, Booker goes through with the baptism and becomes born again as Zachary Comstock. In the other timeline, Booker changes his mind and refuses the baptism, he remains known as Booker DeWitt. Comstock, washed of his guilt, goes on to meet the female version of Lutess and she develops the technology to travel between timelines. In the process of experimenting with the tears, Comstock becomes sterile. During this time he also becomes the leader of Columbia. Booker remains guilt-ridden but finds himself a wife and has a child with her, Anna, who will later be known as Elizabeth. Booker's wife dies during childbirth and around this time he also accrues a massive gambling debt. His life is in shambles. Comstock, who wants an heir for himself, decides to offer his alternate version a deal. Give up the girl and they'll wipe away his gambling debt, allowing him to start fresh. Booker agrees but has second thoughts not long after. Despite this, they manage to take Elizabeth away from him to Comstock's timeline. Some years pass for Booker before the Lutesses intervene and bring him to Comstock's timeline in order to get Elizabeth back. This seems to be because the male Lutess feels guilt about what they did and also because their relationship with Comstock hasn't been good since he tried to kill them. It may also be some sort of experiment to them, their goals are never made entirely clear. This is the point where the game begins. We should also note that Booker's original timeline is no longer important, there are now essentially two Bookers in the other timeline instead. Booker travels along through Comstock's Columbia in search of Elizabeth, and for the first part of the game, time is working linearly as you would expect. This changes when Booker and Elizabeth decide they need guns for the Vox Populi. They eventually discover they exist in a universe where the gunsmith is dead, so they hop across realities to one where he's alive. Unfortunately, in this new universe, his tools have been confiscated, so they go on the look for those, and in the process end up hopping universes again. This time to a reality where Chen Lin is once again dead, but they no longer need him since a rebellion is already happening. Another Booker had already come to this timeline and assisted the Vox before being killed, turning him into a martyr. That Booker is dead, but the player's version of Booker is alive, which causes some confusion and makes the Vox turn against him as well. Time continues linearly again now until Booker and Elizabeth are separated later on. Booker is pulled into the future by an older version of Liz who exists in a timeline where Booker failed to save her. She's become bitter but she wants to try and make things right, so she gives Booker the knowledge he needs to save her and sends him back into the past. The way the timelines work here is a bit fuzzy, because the old version of Liz may have in fact caused her own timeline to be created by pulling Booker into the future. By doing so, she may have ensured he couldn't rescue her and caused the time paradox. This isn't very important though, and since it's not clear, I'll let it slide. Booker uses the knowledge he was given to avoid the timeline where Liz becomes the leader of Columbia, and this is the final bit of time shenanigans before the ending happens. During the ending sequence, Elizabeth and Booker jump to Rapture, and eventually Elizabeth reveals to Booker the concept of infinite realities, each represented by a lighthouse. He sees other versions of themselves wandering around, and Elizabeth explains that all realities are somewhat different, but somewhat similar. This culminates in the baptism scene where Booker learns he was Comstock and many variations of Elizabeth show up to drown Booker in order to stop Comstock from existing. After they do so, they vanish, presumably because they're being erased from existence since Booker was her father. In a post credit scene, we're led to believe that at least one version of Booker survives and it's up to the player to imagine whether Elizabeth still exists as well. That's the entire plot of Bioshock Infinite. I understood it and I didn't like it. The biggest flaw is the decision to drown Booker at the end in order to stop Comstock from existing. Infinite realities means just that. Infinite realities. Elizabeth even says this herself. What are we doing here? Comstock's dead. We can just go on with our lives. You don't need dead? to... You mean like Chen Lin? Like Lady Comstock? No. He is alive in a million, million worlds. This means there is some combination of events that leads Booker to become Comstock even without that particular baptism that day. He could go back to town and then change his mind again. He could become the exact same person Comstock was without changing his name. There are any number of ways this could have gone down. In fact, there could be a reality where the outcome of the baptism choice is reversed. The precedent is set for this in the story. There are more than just two realities in Infinite, there are many. And Booker's baptism decision is not the only one which causes new realities to be born. Keeping this in mind, the decision to drown Booker at the end makes no sense because there will always be a reality where things turn out different. 
In the ending sequence, Elizabeth tries to hastily explain this away by saying some things are always constant. This is, no exaggeration, the worst cop-out I've ever seen. You couldn't formulate a more counterintuitive, nonsensical cop-out if you tried. It runs totally in opposition to the idea of parallel worlds. This is the timeline that Bioshock Infinite seems to think it has, but the truth is actually different. We'll need to revise it because it can be proven that realities were branching well before the baptism. The Lutesses are born as different genders in each universe, an event which far precedes the baptism. Booker's date of birth is 1874. The quote from the paper at the start is from 1889. And the Wounded Knee Massacre took place in 1890, confirming that the Lutesses were born well before the baptism date and likely even before Booker, unless the paper was published when they were 15 years old. This has even worse implications for the timeline because it forks the events even earlier up the chain. The earliest known branching point is actually the conception of Lutess, which ends up being one gender or another. It seems likely that Robert is from Booker's timeline and Rosalind is from Comstock's timeline. Assuming this is the case, then the timeline looks like this. In other words, drowning the player character's Booker would potentially cut off all other futures for him on that branch, but would have absolutely no effect on the other branch. You would need to travel earlier up the timeline in order to affect that path. To put it another way, the only way to stop both of those branches from existing would be to go back in time and kill one of the Lutessa's parents before they were conceived. This confirms that the drowning at the end fixes nothing. Even if we're kind though and assume that somehow drowning Booker will fix all the timelines shown in the game and ensure that Comstock never exists, it's still a flawed concept. If we buy into this scene then the game becomes a giant grandfather paradox. For those not familiar with this concept it's easy to grasp if you apply it to yourself. Suppose you were given the ability to go back in time and for some mad reason you decide while you're in the past you're going to kill your own grandfather. What happens? Well the answer is nobody knows because it doesn't make any sense. If you kill your grandfather, then you'll never be born, and thus you can't go back in time to kill your grandfather since you don't exist. The Many Worlds concept does provide a way to do this if you travel to another timeline and kill your father in an alternate reality, that seems to work out fine. But Infinite wants us to believe that all bookers that could become Comstock or Father Elizabeth will die at this point. It's nothing more than a massive contradiction. If Elizabeth drowns Booker before the baptism, then she can't be born to go back in time and drown her own father. Call me picky, but if a story is going to introduce multiple realities and time travel, I at least expect it to have some idea how these concepts can work. Bioshock Infinite uses quantum mechanics as a shorthand for magic, pulling some absolutely moronic scenes like this one. Are you going to open it? No, it's no good. Damn it. I thought once we were here, I, I could fully control it. I, I thought... What is that? It's a key. Where did it come from? It's always been there, I just... I just couldn't see it. At this point, all semblance of plot has been totally lost. It's almost as though the game is admitting it's all being made up as it goes along. The worst thing is, this scene was completely unnecessary, and moments where Elizabeth talks about how she might be creating universes rather than travelling to them accomplish nothing either, even though it's a point which is repeated several times. The idea of constants and variables seems like it might be some light poke at the structure of games in general, after all games are built on constants and variables. Everyone playing Bioshock Infinite will have a somewhat similar, but somewhat different experience. This allusion to the fact that the player is playing a game is the last bastion of hope for anyone trying to defend the plot of Bioshock Infinite, but in the end it accomplishes nothing. It says absolutely nothing about the nature of computer games which isn't plainly obvious to anyone who's played one. This is one of the great tricks of Infinite. It jumbles together such a mess of cluttered ideas at the end that people will be drawn to defend it because it seems a lot deeper than it is. In reality, it's several shallow ideas that look deep unless you view them from the right angle. The multiple worlds element is a poorly thought out ploy to include a couple of twists about the identity of the characters involved. And even if we're kind again and ignore the problems this raises, the plot is still shot full of holes. Here's a list of some of the problems I had with the story. The first one comes early on, when Booker sees the poster explaining the mark of the false prophet, which is obviously a very bad thing to have, yet Booker makes no attempt to conceal his hand using a bandage or something. 
He then proceeds to the RAF Olympics number 77, even though he was explicitly told not to earlier on. Upon realising this, he passively accepts it. These were probably placed to tie into that idea of constants earlier on, but both of these actions are completely moronic, and it causes a disconnect when a character behaves so stupidly in the first 15 minutes of the game. Elizabeth has received a lot of praise for her characterization, but on a fundamental level she doesn't behave the way she should. She spent her entire life locked away, being experimented on and watched constantly. Considering how dangerous she is and how much she wanted to escape, it's unlikely she's been allowed out of the tower in many years, if ever. Yet, despite having barely interacted with other human beings, she acts like a bouncy, upbeat Disney princess with better social skills than Booker. I'd expect a girl who went through this to be emotionally distant, untrustworthy, anxious around others, and incapable of interacting with people normally. The goal was to make us like her though, so the easiest way to accomplish this was to give her an upbeat personality and shove it in the player's face constantly. It would have been too difficult to get us interested in an emotionally withdrawn Elizabeth and who would care about her anyway when you're busy shooting guys in the face. When Booker and Elizabeth find the tools for Chen Lin later in the story, they're shocked to realise they don't know how to get them back to his shop, which highlights just how insanely stupid they are. The game sidesteps this with a convenient use of tears to get Booker and Elizabeth where they need to be. When Booker and Elizabeth are heading to Comstock Zeppelin, Booker says they should just take the platform they're on and go to Paris. If any of those platforms could have done that, then why didn't they attempt to leave Colombia much sooner? Why did they even bother trying to find guns for the Vox when there's multiple ways for them to escape? If being dead in one universe but alive in another can drive someone insane, then why isn't everybody insane since they'd all be dead in some other universe? These are just some of the questions raised by the overt storytelling, but the setting is at odds with itself throughout the whole game. Only a handful of enemies use the Vigors over the course of the entire thing, and their place within Columbia is unclear. The plasmids in Bioshock 1 fit with the central premise of the game quite well. They showed how scientific advancement could leap ahead if unconstrained by morality. Of course, the destruction of Rapture ended up being the cost. Vigors have no real reason to exist in Columbia, and the general populace never seemed to partake in them. There's no particular reason Columbia had to be in the sky either, whereas Rapture was clearly put at the bottom of the ocean to hide it from the rest of the world. Audio logs were nonsensical enough in the 1960s, and Infinite has no problem bringing them back even further, to the point where the technology has to be represented by a giant spinning record. That's not a convenient method for someone to transcribe their thoughts. It also makes no sense for the voxophones to be sprinkled around everywhere. People seem to just be randomly leaving clips of their personal thoughts scattered around the city. At least in Rapture, everything was strewn around everywhere. The entire city had been pillaged, so it made a lot more sense for audio logs to be scattered randomly around the place. Columbia is a replica of Rapture without any of the backstory which propped Rapture up. There's no reason the protagonist should be running around compulsively eating cakes and hot dogs out of bins. Perhaps the ultimate question I have for Bioshock Infinite is the following. Why was Bioshock Infinite a first-person shooter? In what ways does this contribute to the central ideas of the story? It doesn't expand on the many worlds concept, and in fact presenting this from a solely first person perspective in the middle of an action game is a much less than ideal way to go about this. It's not a good father-daughter bonding story either. It's tough to imagine Elizabeth caring so much about a man who mercilessly slaughters hundreds of people over the course of the game, including the Vox Populi. She's not realistically characterised, and their relationship is only revealed at the end as a twist. Before that you could easily be forgiven for thinking it was going to end with a romantic coupling. It's not a good redemption story either, because both Booker and Comstock have no depth, and both of them are assholes right the way through to the end. It doesn't help drive home the nationalistic stuff either, and even the baseball scene at the start doesn't take advantage of the first-person viewpoint. The only reason for Bioshock Infinite to be a first-person shooter is because that's what sells. The gameplay has no impact on the narrative, and in fact serves to undermine it at many points. An apologist might say Bioshock Infinite deserves more slack than I've given it here so far because it pushes the medium forward, but that's far from the truth. To prove this I'm going to pick out a game which was released a long time ago and is, in my opinion, unquestionably better than Bioshock Infinite in every regard, despite having some similar ideals. Hello. Oddworld Abe's Odyssey was released back in 1997. Story-wise it bears some similarity to Bioshock Infinite and also Bioshock 1, but executed almost everything far better than those games. The game follows the protagonist Abe who works as a slave in Rupture Farms, a meatpacking plant. 
Rupture Farms is an incredibly grim looking place and it's clear the game has a message about how cruel the meat industry is, not unlike the heavy handed messages of Infinite about slavery. Abe's Odyssey also includes slavery, but in this case it's perpetrated by a cruel corporation, and Abe learns that the business is about to start cutting up him and his friends to sell them off as the next tasty treat. This prompts him to attempt an escape and try to rescue his fellow slaves along the way. In the same way that Bioshock has used cities to get its messages across to the player, Abe's Odyssey uses a corporation for the same purposes. Both games were consciously designed to broach topics that you're unlikely to see in other games. Unlike Bioshock Infinite, Abe's Odyssey doesn't pull any punches. At times it's an incredibly dark game, which drives home the plight of Abe and his fellow slaves. Odyssey takes place in an imaginative world with fictional races, but it acts as a mirror to our own. Just look at the design of the Gluckens, for example. Their shape and demeanour immediately lets you know that these guys are the odd world parallel of corporate board members in our world. Because Abe's Odyssey uses non-human characters, it easily gets away with all sorts of things, like stitching the slaves' mouths shut or shredding them in meat grinders. It doesn't compromise its message in the slightest, and I'd argue it accomplishes as much as Bioshock Infinite does with its setting, which is to say not a huge amount beyond the initial intro. Beyond its imaginative and well-realized setting, Abe's Odyssey rises above Bioshock when it comes to the actual game portion of the computer game. The gameplay in Abe's Odyssey stands out, even among its own subgenre of cinematic platformers. It's more welcoming than many of its predecessors, such as Another World or Flashback, but it doesn't sacrifice complexity in order to appeal to a wide audience. It eases players in, but becomes more and more intricate as it unfolds, weaving several gameplay elements into a cohesive whole. If baseballs existed on Oddworld, Abe's Odyssey would trust the player to be able to throw one. Abe's Exodus, the sequel, streamlined the gameplay in the right ways, by allowing multiple Mudokans to follow Abe and adding the ability to quick save at any point. More importantly though, it expanded on the wonderful base that Abe's Odyssey had provided, by including new gameplay elements which fit perfectly with the existing ones. Bioshock Infinite should have been to Bioshock what Abe's Exodus was to Abe's Odyssey. Best of all, Abe's gameplay is never in opposition with its storytelling. The focus in Abe's Odyssey is on escape, along with rescuing Abe's buddies, and it doesn't evolve into non-stop action for no reason. Instead, there are moments where Abe is totally powerless and needs to avoid detection, and moments where Abe can possess the sligs and turn the tables. There's a balance here, and Abe never comes off as a mass-murdering psychopath even if he laughs when he blows up the sligs. Again, this is a benefit of using a more abstract setting, because sligs aren't human and seem to be totally irredeemable, unlike human beings. There's a reason for all the basic gameplay elements to exist. Abe isn't distracted by looting slig bodies for pineapples or cigarettes, his companions aren't invincible for no reason, and when he moves from one environment to another, the gameplay elements shift to match them. Abe's Odyssey feels like a perfect fit for the cinematic platformer genre. Bioshock Infinite feels like an incredibly poor fit for its genre. Years before Bioshock 1 would struggle to implement a half-decent moral choice system which it would present to the player with button prompts, Abe had implemented a morality system which worked in unison with the core gameplay. Every time the player comes across a fellow Mudokan, they have a choice whether or not to save them, and players aren't even told at the start of the game that the way they treat Mudokans can affect the ending. If they fail to save more than half of them, then they get the bad ending, but alternatively they get the good one. This is a genuine trade-off for the player because some of them are quite difficult to rescue. It's totally in the player's hands whether they want to bother with this or not, and the game judges them accordingly, which is a fair judgement. The less you're consciously thinking about a moral choice a game presents, the more it will truly reflect who you are. The last thing I'll say about Abe's Odyssey is it doesn't have a litany of plot holes. Even though the plot takes itself far less seriously than Bioshock, the story is completely consistent. The characters all behave the way you'd expect, and the resolution is satisfying. Well, the good ending is, anyway. The story taking itself much less seriously isn't necessarily a good thing, but it stops the game from giving off the pretentious vibe I get from Infinite. Infinite thinks it's clever when really it's full of holes, integrates its plot and setting less seamlessly than a game from 1997, and has mediocre gameplay in the most worn-out genre of its time. In the end, Abe's Odyssey triumphs over Bioshock Infinite in many ways. I have to wonder then why a game being released 13 years later is getting far more recognition and attention. Something tells me a large marketing budget combined with lowest common denominator gameplay is to blame. Perhaps it also has to do with games journalists of today having an insecure need to justify their own existence by evangelizing games like Bioshock Infinite as mature storytelling. 
Abe's Odyssey was just an example. I picked it because it happened to be similar to Bioshock with its heavy-handed messages and extreme environments which symbolise ideologies. There are plenty of other games out there which wonderfully accomplish things where Bioshock Infinite fails. If you want to see a full-length escort mission which doesn't simply remove the companion from the equation, then I suggest you play Eco. If you want to see how an interactive narrative can explore the many worlds theory to its fullest, then I suggest you play Virtue's Last Reward. If you want to shoot hundreds of people in the face, play Bioshock Infinite, or one of the many, many, many other games where you can do the exact same thing. I'll admit I've been somewhat hard on Infinite in this video, and to be fair I have glossed over a few good areas of the game such as the aesthetics, some of the sound design, and the skylines. My intent here has never been to provide a completely balanced view on this game, but rather to show how the endless praise around it has been utterly absurd. It's important to talk about Infinite in a rational way and examine its many flaws, because getting caught up in the hype and labelling this game as a masterpiece says to other developers that it's okay to keep producing this kind of stuff. For all the bland shooting games out there, Bioshock Infinite might represent a step in the right direction, but in a general sense it's not the kind of game I think we as players should be encouraging. It's just another shooter with some tacked on themes that aren't well explored or well thought out. By praising Bioshock Infinite, the gaming community is effectively saying that it's okay to turn everything into a shooter, no matter how much that undermines the rest of the elements. Personally, I'm sick of large budget releases being dominated by shooters, especially ones which have regenerating health and unsatisfying weapons. There was a game released back in 1978 which you may have heard of. It was called Space Invaders. In Space Invaders, the player goes up against a horde of enemies, and they tackle those enemies by shooting them. The player was allotted a couple of objects near the bottom of the playing field which they could use as cover. The idea was to pop out, shoot some invaders and pop back into cover if necessary. Like a lot of modern games, Bioshock Infinite is Space Invaders with a new coat of paint. Only Space Invaders had better gameplay because you at least had a chance to dodge the enemy bullets instead of soaking them up like a sponge. If everyone keeps blindly buying into the hype and praising stuff like Bioshock Infinite, then we'll all be stuck playing Space Invaders forever.